I want to sincerely thank everybody for attending our lecture tonight on prostate cancer. This is a first lecture out of two lectures on prostate cancer. Yeah, I think it's, it's fantastic that you're taking this time to educate yourselves, educate your families and your spouses about the best things to do in the evaluation and treatment of prostate cancer. Uh, we're going to go through some controversial subjects and hope to clarify some things for you to help you better understand how to um, continue to have good health. And we've also teamed up with Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. We at Boulder Medical Center, Dr. Siegel and I, work very closely with the doctors at Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. And this team approach allows us to give a true multidisciplinary approach to prostate cancer treatment. We are so fortunate in this town to be able to support all of these specialists. And when I'm talking about multidisciplinary care, I mean the urologists, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists, the radiologists, and the genetic counselors. We all communicate and can talk together to give our patients the highest quality in outcomes and care. There's significant data on the multidisciplinary approach. And with this approach, we give improved benefits to our patients. We allow patients to have shared decision making and patients are much more satisfied with their treatment decision once they have been able to talk to all the specialists. Topics that Dr. Siegel and I are gonna to cover tonight include the epidemiology of prostate cancer. We're gonna dive deep into the PSA screening. When you get an elevated PSA, what do we do? How do we approach it in clinic? We're gonna talk about the really Im impressive and new techniques for diagnosing prostate cancer. We're gonna talk about what happens if you have an elevated PSA and some bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms but are not found to have prostate cancer. What do we do with patients like that? And then we'll go on to talking about diagnosis. Prostate cancer is a very important topic. In fact, I had a patient in my office today that said, I am so glad you're doing this lecture. There's so many guys in my circle who just don't think that we should worry about prostate cancer. And you know what? They're not correct. Prostate cancer remains the number one diagnosed cancer in the United States, and it is the second leading cause of death of cancer in the United States, death from, death, from, death from cancer. So what are the risk factors for prostate cancer? Well, being a man and being older. Also, family history. If you have a father that had prostate cancer, you're two times more likely to have prostate cancer. If you have a brother, you're four times more likely. And if you have a brother and a father, eight times more likely to have prostate cancer. And often, that prostate cancer is more aggressive. Also, African Americans have a greater risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. If you have multiple cancers in your family, specifically if you've had a, a relative with metastatic prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, male or female breast cancer, colorectal, endometrial, or pancreatic cancer, if you're Ashkenazi Jewish descent, or if you have multiple cancers in your family. Also, germline mutations are becoming very important factors in terms of finding patients who have very aggressive prostate cancer. A study back by the New England, published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at several germline mutations and found that the BRCA2 genetic mutation is associated with 44% of cancers that are metastatic. So the starting place for uh, finding prostate cancer is often with the PSA blood test. Uh, PSA is a simple blood test. It can be added to your, your panel of blood uh, draws that are going to be done at your next physical. And we'll talk about when exactly it should be uh, obtained for you. But it's a simple blood test. It measures the amount of PSA in your bloodstream. Uh, PSA is a substance that's made by all prostate cells, and it's also made by prostate cancer cells more, so that's why we can use it as a screening test uh, for uh, prostate cancer. But there are lots of other reasons why a um, PSA can be elevated. And so just because your PSA comes back elevated, that certainly does not mean that you have prostate cancer. It just means you end up in one of our two offices. Uh, but the other causes for uh, an elevated PSA include you've got a large prostate. Like I said, all prostate cells make PSA, so if you've got a larger prostate, it does make sense that you would have a higher PSA. 
Uh, any infection or inflammation of the prostate can lead to a, an elevated PSA. Uh, anything that is, is causing uh, stimulation of the prostate, like a long car ride, a bike ride, recent ejaculation, any of those kind of things, even a rectal exam, any of those things can, uh, can cause the PSA to be uh, temporarily uh, elevated. And for that reason, it, it, it does become important for urologists to help you sort through your elevated PSA to determine is this something that really needs to be evaluated or not. The history of PSA is actually quite interesting. If you look at this, this graph here, uh, this, is look, this top line is looking at the incidence of prostate cancer. And from the years 1975 to 1990, there was a little bit of an increase in, uh, in the incidence of prostate cancer, but a relatively flat line. And that, whoops, I went up one. Uh, and that's because um, at that time, the only way to diagnose prostate cancer was with a rectal exam and your physician finding a nodule. Um, PSA came about in the early 1990s, and you'll see there was a, a gigantic spike in the, the incidence of prostate cancer being detected because these were men that were being found earlier than they otherwise would have been. With that increased detection and that earlier detection of prostate cancer, we saw something great. We saw a de decrease in the mortality from prostate cancer, thus proving that PSA is an important blood test. and. Um, and very significant for men to have this blood test on a routine basis in order to identify prostate cancer and hopefully identify it early enough that patients can be cured and we could, we could continue to see the mortality rate decrease. Uh, but then the United States Preventative Task Force uh, got involved and they kind of looked at things and said, wow, there's a lot of these blood tests that are being done and that's turning into more prostate biopsies, more prostate surgeries, more uh, referrals over to radiation oncologists, and is it making any difference? And so there, a group of, of, of these of physicians, which interestingly did not include any urologists, um, made a determination that PSA was not a relevant test. And they gave a long list of reasons why it was not an, an important test. Some of them included overtreatment by urologists, but I, I've read this uh, report, and one of them, in, it, one of the risks included that you could get a bruise from your blood draw. So uh, we never put a lot of weight into this, and the urologic community has worked hard to try to educate patients that obtaining a PSA is still an important thing to do. And so um, what happened when people stopped getting PSAs drawn? Um, the incidence of prostate cancer, being able to, to detect prostate cancer went down because once again, we went back to those days that the only way of finding prostate cancer was if you had a nodule, because there were a lot of uh, family practice physicians uh, who were telling their patients that PSA was no longer necessary, and they had the backup of the federal government telling them that that was the, the right way to think about it. And then what happened next? Well, the number of deaths began to increase so after we saw this nice decrease in, in prostate cancer, now all of a sudden the incidence of death from prostate cancer started going up. So with that, the American Urologic Association really uh, worked hard to try to convince this task force to take another look at their recommendations. And so they fortunately did make a, a different decision. And instead of discouraging physicians and patients from obtaining PSAs, said, you know what, there are times where it's appropriate to get a PSA and we'll go through the, uh, the, the age uh, issues, but that it really is a shared decision process between the patient and their physician. So these are the recommendations that are from the American Urologic Association. Um, they're actually new guidelines about prostate cancer just came out within the last couple months, and these are straight from there. But it, it says, listen, when, you, when you're under the age of 40, there really is no reason to get a PSA. The incidence of prostate cancer is just way too low, so you shouldn't do it then. If you're between the ages of 40 and 54, and you have just an average risk, meaning um, that you're just, you have none of the risk factors that Dr. Franzak spoke about, then maybe you don't need a PSA. But if you do have some of those risk factors, you have a family history uh, with a father, a brother, a first degree relative, or your family has multiple cancers, including prostate, breast, ovarian, or pancreatic, or if you're African American, that you probably should have a PSA and have it done annually in order to uh, screen for prostate cancer. The group that's aged 55 to 69, uh, you're the target audience. You're the ones who are gonna be 
um, most susceptible to prostate cancer, and you're also the ones that are gonna benefit the most by having your PSA checked so that if you're the type of person that's going to develop prostate cancer, that we're gonna be able to detect that early. So that is considered something that you should discuss with your physician. Uh, my argument would be is that you're probably going to get some blood tests anyway, all, and it doesn't add anything to it, so that you should have your PSA checked. Once you hit the age of 70, the American Urologic Association says maybe there's a, a different decision to be made and that um, you need to have that conversation with your physician. But the important part to your age is what is your life expectancy? And one of the things that is fantastic about this community where we live is that the life expectancy seems to be a lot higher than the rest of the country. And so if you're a 75-year-old and you're still biking up Flagstaff, then absolutely you're someone who should continue to have your PSA checked. So continue your discussions with your physician as to uh, whether or not that's appropriate for you. But if you're an active person, I would continue to have your PSA checked. And then the American Cancer Society has helped um, define things as well and saying that, you know, if your PSA is really low, normal is less than four, but if your PSA is less than two and a half, then maybe you can go, uh, instead of doing it annually, maybe even go up to every four years. Uh, but if it's greater than two and a half, then it should be done at least every two years. And the American Neurologic Association believes it should be done every year. I will turn it back, back to Dr. Franzek. Excellent, thank you. So as Dr. Siegel mentioned, when we see a patient, it's most of the time with an elevated PSA. And so the question is, how do we go about approaching this in our office? Our goal is to maximize the detection of lethal prostate cancer. And we'll talk about the staging, but lethal prostate cancer is prostate cancer that can kill a man in 10 to 15 years. We want to also use our technology to accurately assess the biology of the tumor. And we have the ability to do that now. And we also want to risk stratify the patient. We want to minimize treatment of indolent cancers, and we want to maximize treatment of cancers that, like I said, are lethal, that will potentially cause significant morbidity and mortality. So what is an initial evaluation like? It will always include a rectal exam and a look at the PSA. So we'll look at the value that the PSA, of the PSA that the patient has, and if it's been set steady and all of a sudden there's a spike, my first intuition is to say, hey, let's recheck that PSA. Let's not just go off the spike. Let's make sure we look at a velocity or a trend so we can establish what is going on. So that, that's one of the first things. That's the last thing on my list here. But I will also say that I encourage all my patients, when they get their PSAs checked, to have five days of pelvic rest. And there's arguments, three days, five days. I think if a man can do at least five days, that's great. Even three days, that's great. And what I mean by pelvic rest is no sex, no masturbation, no bike riding, no ejaculation, pelvic rest. So we can try to keep any artificial spikes in the PSA from happening. So also in our clinic, if you have an abnormal rectal exam, but a normal PSA, that is still gonna trigger an evaluation. Also, it's important to know that even if you have an elevated PSA between four and 10, only 25% of those men will have a positive biopsy upon evaluation with a biopsy. Now let's talk about if you have an abnormal rectal exam, but a normal PSA. So, it's important to know that some prostate cancers don't make PSA. And in fact, in the last month, I have found two older men who they had a nodule in their prostate. We ended up getting an MRI, we'll talk about that. Ended up getting a biopsy and they had an aggressive prostate cancer and their PSAs were not above two. So it's important that a rectal exam is done. And I know a lot of primary care doctors don't do it. Please send them to Dr. Siegel and I. We are more than happy to do those rectal exams. So now we're going to talk about other testing to decide on biopsy. So we, we understand completely that patients would like to uh, avoid prostate biopsies, and we'd like to help you avoid those prostate biopsies. So there certainly is no knee-jerk reaction 
when a patient shows up with an elevated PSA that says, we must do a prostate biopsy. In fact, we like to do several tests ahead of time uh, in order to prove that it is appropriate to uh, undergo a, a biopsy. But the biopsy is the only way that we're gonna truly be able to diagnose uh, prostate cancer, and it's the only way that we're gonna actually start discussions about any, whether treatment is needed, would be with the biopsy. So there are tests that we're gonna talk about that can tell us the, your relative risk of prostate cancer, even the relative risk of aggressive prostate cancer, and those can help push us one way or the other in terms of proceeding with a biopsy. But again, um, the biopsy is, is not our first choice. It's, it's what we want to get to at the end of the evaluation. And one way we can do that is with MRI. So we, we've been able to use uh, Boulder Community Hospital uh, to help us a lot um, with obtaining MRIs, making it simpler for patients uh, to get there and, and get uh, a, a full evaluation of the prostate with MRI. Um, MRI is a way to get a great look at the prostate and we can tr see lesions that we otherwise couldn't see. So they, the MRI can help us in a number of ways. If we do examine you and think we feel a nodule, the MRI can help determine is that nodule within the prostate? Does it look like a benign nodule? Does it look like a malignant um, mo uh, nodule? Um, when you have an elevated PSA and we send you for an MRI, the MRI can help identify lesions that maybe we otherwise wouldn't be able to see uh, on ultrasound at the time of biopsy to help us decide um, what we can target for a biopsy. And we can, with the, the technology that Boulder Community Hospital now has, uh, we are able to do MRI fusion biopsies. And in fact, we get referrals from around the state from other offices because of this ability to do MRI fusion biopsy. Um, I'll, we'll show you some images later of what that looks like, but it's essentially we're taking those MRI images. Um, the radiologists at Boulder Community Hospital are, are able to uh, use software to draw a target on the lesions that they found within the MRI. And then when it's time to do a biopsy, we're able to actually hit those specific areas. Um, we also can use an MRI to take a look at the tissue and go, you know what? We don't see anything there. Even though your PSA is elevated, um, there is no obvious evidence of, of cancer. There are no abnormal lesions. Maybe instead of doing a biopsy right away, we can, we can follow your PSA. Now, it doesn't mean that the MRI is perfect. There are times where the MRI doesn't see a, a cancer, but it does help us uh, rule out any big and bad tumors within the prostate. Um, we can also reduce the, the identification of any low-risk cancers and increase finding the, the higher-risk uh, cancers, which are the, the lethal ones that we've been speaking about that are important to, to uh, treat. Finally, the way we use MRI is if someone has been diagnosed with prostate cancer but has a more uh, indolent form of the cancer and one that doesn't require surgery or radiation or any other type of treatment up front, we can use the MRI to follow these lesions and determine if there's any, any growth or change in these over time. So the report that we get back from the, the Boulder uh, Community Hospital radiologist includes what's called the PIRAD score. Um, and the PIRAD score you can see on the left side in the Roman numerals is just one through five. And this is uh, telling us based on what they've seen within the prostate, are there any lesions that they think look malignant? Because they do have ways of differentiating malignant versus benign. So as you can see, as the number gets higher, the likelihood of malignancy goes up. And so the, the patients that do have specific lesions that should be targeted are called PIRADS 4 and 5. And those are the ones that we, we do sign up for the uh, MRI fusion biopsy so that we can make sure that if we're going to do a biopsy, that you get the very best biopsy that you can get, which is one that is targeting specific lesions. Uh, this is an image from an actual patient of mine. Um, the top two pictures and the one on the lower left are all MRI images. They're, they're done from different angles, and that's, that's why they look differently. But the, uh, the purple circle uh, identifies the prostate. The, le the yellow uh, smaller circle is one of the specific lesions uh, within the, uh, the prostate. This patient actually had three lesions within their prostate, 
um, that were identified by the radiologist. This is just showing some images of, of the largest one that was seen. And then if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see a, a cartoon image of the prostate with the lesion in it that was created by the software. And so then when it's time to biopsy this patient, we can take our ultrasound machine and overlay the, the ultrasound images directly on these images so that we are now looking specifically at the lesions so to make sure that we can target them. And so that the patient, if they're gonna go through having a prostate biopsy, can make sure to have the biopsy that they need. And so if there's a cancer, we're gonna find it. So this is a, a cartoon of that same patient. Um, this uh, blue lesion on the top, uh, top left, that was the, the yellow one on the previous uh, images. And then these other two smaller lesions uh, at the bottom, the, sm the small yellow one and the small blue one, were the two other lesions seen within the prostate. The cylinders that you see through this area are all the biopsies that were obtained. So um, we made sure that, that since this patient had three lesions that we hit each lesion with several biopsies so that we could make sure to biopsy those areas that the radiologist was mainly concerned about. But then as you can see, we also went around the remainder of the prostate to uh, get a good sampling of the rest of the prostate to determine is, are there other areas that could be cancer um, and, and do they have the same biology? And you know, there are times when we do this that the only cancer that we find is, is within the lesion and all other biopsies are negative. There are other times that we find cancer in lesions and around different parts of the prostate. Um, and then there, I've had a few occasions where the lesions have been benign and yet we found cancer in other areas. And that's why it's important and the standard of care to not just biopsy these lesions, but also to biopsy around the prostate. Um, and as we said, you know, the, 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 the MRI is not a, a perfect approach, um, but it's getting more perfect. And it, it's really been a benefit to us and to our patients to have this available to us um, and to have the relationship that we have with, uh, with our Boulder Community Health radiologists uh, to really improve upon the identification of dangerous lesions within the prostate. Um, when we do a biopsy, um, we, we use this transrectal approach. There is a second approach that is being talked about a little bit more. Uh, it's called transperineal. Um, there's a, just wanted to point out some of the differences and just explain the, the process. Uh, every man comes to our office terrified of having a biopsy. Nobody, nobody wants to do that. I, I, and I can promise you 90% of my patients when they leave the office after biopsy say, that wasn't that big a deal. Um, but it, it involves just laying on your side. There's an ultrasound probe that goes into the rectum. It goes up probably two or three inches, and that's as far as it needs to go because that's where the prostate is. And then uh, either using this MRI to help us or in patients who haven't had MRIs, we can just use the ultrasound approach and, and be able to slide a small needle through the prostate once we've uh, numbed it up and, and get uh, samples of the prostate and have a pathologist look at it and let us know whether or not prostate cancer is present. Uh, it's a procedure that takes about 10 minutes. It doesn't require any sedation. Patients walk in, they walk out. The biggest risk um, for a transrectal uh, ultrasound uh, biopsy is infection. Uh, we are going through the rectum, and so we, we, we do try to come up with the best way to try to prevent uh, infections from this, and it does involve pre-treating with antibiotics we often do what's called a rectal swab, which is a way of uh, looking at the bacteria that is in each specific patient and looking at the antibiotic susceptibility of those bacteria so that we make sure to give you an antibiotic that can uh, treat whatever bacteria lives in your colon. And by doing that method, we really have been able to be on this lower uh, end of the infection rate. Uh, we don't really see any other problems. I mean, you, patients will see blood after the procedure, we are puncturing the prostate, but that uh, resolves on itself. But patients don't need to go to sleep. Uh, they don't even need a Valium for the procedure. Um, and it's a less expensive, easier approach to uh, getting to the uh, prostate. Uh, transperineal biopsies are being done in some centers. Uh, I've honestly avoided them because it, as, as the picture indicates, instead of laying nicely on your side and doing a 10 minute procedure, this involves 
legs going up in the air like you're going to have a baby. Uh, it usually involves not only Valium, but either uh, general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia because it is more painful. Uh, but this is an approach where instead of the needle passing through the, the ultrasound probe that's in the rectum, uh, this approach, the ultrasound probe is still in the rectum, but needles are passed through the skin directly. It does have a, a reduced infection rate because you're not going through the rectum, uh, but interestingly, the, the urinary obstruction rate is significantly higher. I've seen numbers as much as up to 10% and patients being pretreated with uh, Flomax in order to help open up the prostate to help prevent that um, complication. So we still use the transrectal approach. I still think it's the best approach um, and we'll continue to do it that way. You're doing genomics? Yeah. So in addition to MRI, we also do a lot of optional testing as well that is looking at biomarkers. And these are called genomic tests. And the genomic tests that are available really have helped us eliminate doing biopsies in some of our patients and encourage us to do biopsies in others. So what is a genomic test? A, a genomic test is looking at a biomarker, and a biomarker is a protein that is either secreted by a tumor or it's a protein that is put into the bloodstream in response to a tumor. So there are several different companies that have been perfecting the genomic testing. And Dr. Siegel and I primarily, I'll talk about the genomic testing that we use in our office. We, we primarily want to focus on genomic tests that are able to differ, differentiate a, a man having a likelihood of aggressive prostate cancer or meaningful prostate cancer versus the, the low-grade indolent cancer. And when genomic tests first came out, like the uh, Prostate Health Index and uh, okay. PCA3, PCA3 came out, the, those just would say if there was a likelihood that there's prostate cancer. It would not differentiate between meaningful versus indolent cancers. But now, the genomic tests, as I said, have gotten a lot better, and we, again, only want to focus on those genomic tests that offer meaningful information. And this slide I took from an AUA lecture last year, and I, it just helps demonstrate how genomics is really becoming a very important part all the way through the prostate cancer screening to advanced disease process. And you'll see that the 4K score, ExoDX, SelectMDX, that helps decide, do we want to even do a biopsy? And then if someone possibly had a positive biopsy, then we use Decipher or Oncotype, Prolaris, Promark to help determine how aggressive is this cancer and to help basically give a, give a realistic approach to the patient on whether they should treat this cancer or not. So I'm going to go through those um, briefly. So there are blood tests. There's a blood test, which is the 4K score, and then there are urine tests. So let me talk about the blood test. It's the 4K score. This is a, a blood test that looks at uh, known markers in the blood, and it also takes into account characteristics of the patient. So it takes into account their family history of prostate cancer, race, what was the rectal exam like, what was their, did they have a previous biopsy? And you get a little kit at our office and then you take it to Quest Diagnostics, because Quest is the lab that is designated for 4K, and then a result comes back. But you do have to have a PSA above 4 for it to be um, a relative result, and they won't run the test if it's less than 4. So 4K we use all the time. You use it too. Um, Select MDX, one of my favorite tests, it is a urine test that is a post-rectal exam evaluation. So what that means is you come, to my, you come to the office with a full bladder, a rectal exam is done, but it's a prostate massage, meaning I'm going to press a little more firm on your prostate and I'm going to push out some prostate secretions into your urethra you're going to go void right away, and you're going to catch some of those secretions in the urine, and that's the test that gets sent off to the, to the company. This test is really nice because, again, it separates low risk versus possible diagnosis of prostate cancer versus finding meaningful prostate cancer. It has an excellent negative predictive value, and I'm just going to briefly explain that. What that means is if it comes back low risk, it's very likely you do not have prostate cancer. So that's a, a very important result. 
It also has good accuracy. Its sensitivity is 93%, so it's, a, it's an accurate test. And again, these tests help reduce the number of biopsies that are done, unnecessary biopsies that are done. ExoDX is a newer test on the market. We started using it this year. It is another urine test. It's looking at RNA, and it, though, does not require a rectal exam to be done for this test. So the kit can actually be shipped to the patient's home. They can come to pick the kit up at our office. And then whenever the, the man wants to do the test, they can void into a, a little additive, and they send it off, and it gives us a result. Again, very good negative predictive value. So if it comes back low risk, unlikely prostate cancer. So confirmed DX is another genomic test, but this test is done on prostate biopsy samples that are benign. And this is the only company that I'm aware of that does this. We will send the prostate tissue that is benign to this company. And when we always do a prostate biopsy, we know exactly where in the prostate, we know relatively exactly in the prostate where we have done the biopsy. So have we done it at the base, at the apex, at the mid of the prostate, right or left side? And this company will look at the tissue and they'll look at the methylation of the genes. And if the genes have a hypermethylation result, they will notify us and say, hey, the right apex was positive. And so even though this man had a, a negative biopsy, this tells us that maybe there's something going on in this tissue here and that we will possibly be more aggressive in our follow-up with this patient in the future and make a decision to maybe biopsy again. At next, I want to just briefly talk about what do we do when a man has come to us with an elevated PSA and they say, you know, I also have some urine problems. I'm, I'm having a weak stream. I get up a lot at night. I have some hesitancy with my stream. And we say, okay, we have this elevated PSA. We, we really need to work that up first, make sure there's no prostate cancer going on. And then once we feel comfortable with that, and we've said either there, we find low-risk prostate cancer that we're not going to treat, or we find no prostate cancer, then the discussion becomes more of, how can we improve your quality of life? How can we make your voiding symptoms less bothersome? And so Dr. Siegel and I are very much into treating enlarged prostate. That's one of the standards of uro urologic care. We approach enlarged prostate treatment not only on a man's symptoms, on how bothersome is their weak stream or how, how much they get up at night, but also we look at it from an anatomical aspect in terms of how much is the bladder suffering by trying to void against a closed system? So we basically say if the pipe is clogged and the bladder is trying to squeeze against a clogged pipe, we need to open that pipe up so the bladder does not burn itself out over time. We see men, unfortunately, that are wearing a catheter. And if they would have just taken care of this 10 years ago, five years ago even, they may not be catheter dependent. But there's always the 80-year-old gentleman that is in our office that we're changing their catheter every month because their bladder actually is no longer working. The muscle has deteriorated, and it's been replaced with collagen, and they have a bladder that is, is not, is not going to serve them well. So one of the minimally invasive procedures that Dr. Siegel and I are very proud to be part of, and we are actually both a center of excellence for Eurolift um, is, is Eurolift. We do this procedure in our office, and it is uh, one of the highest efficacy procedures for BPH. It does not require an OR procedure. And we will basically take a small little implant and push the prostate lobes apart from each other so we unclog the pipe that way. And we're just very proud because I believe we, there's no other, there is no other urology group in the nation that has the entire group of urologists as center of excellence. So center of excellence is something difficult to achieve, and uh, we are proud to be part of that. So if you have any concerns on how you void, please come see us for our, for our uh, ability to do your Eurolift. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And I know that um, one of the topics that, that um, patients want to hear about are more imaging and uh, PSMA has been in the news a lot, and I'm happy to, to say that that's now going to be available 
in Boulder, um, our radiation oncologists are the ones that are going to be providing that service. Um, and it's really going to help uh, identify not only is prostate cancer present, which is what we're really talking about right now, but where is it? And if you have a recurrence of cancer, how do we find it? How do we treat it? And that's going to be a topic that um, we're going to tackle, not in this lecture, because I think it's appropriate that our radiation oncologists um, speak about that. But at the end of June, I think it's June 28th, there's going to be a second lecture um, re regarding uh, prostate cancer. And I hope you guys will all, will all join us. But um, that's going to be an, a, a great time to hear about uh, PSMA uh, studies and, and the other things that the radiation oncologists are providing for uh, our community and our patients. But getting back to, you know, so now we've done your biopsy and the pathologist says it's prostate cancer. Well, that's not the end of the discussion on a pathology report. The next important thing is how aggressive is it? Um, how do we know whether or not we need to treat this or is this something that can be followed? And so this is the, the Gleason score. Th this, is, this came out decades ago and it's actually still quite appropriate, but it's a little confusing. So I'm gonna try to walk you through it. Um, but but any, if you talk to friends and families that have, are dealing with prostate cancer across the country, they're gonna tell you about their Gleason score. So the Gleason score is derived based on this uh, little artwork in the middle of the slide showing the patterns of cells. And it goes from the top of the, of the slide down to the bottom in terms of how normal cells look. And now maybe none of this looks normal to you, um, but the prostate is a gland and the prostate cancer happens within those glands. And so if, if there's these nice little circular patterns at the top, that's a pretty normal looking gland. And if you go all the way down to the bottom, it looks nothing like what's at the top. And, that, and that's showing a cancer getting more and more aggressive. So it used to be that they, the, the, the pathologist would look at this, and it would look at your cancer and say, all right, well, I'm looking at this area, and this is a one, two, three, four, five pattern. And then say, okay, now I'm gonna look at this other area, and this is a one, two, three, four, or five pattern. And then we add them together, and that's what, how you derive the Gleason score. Well, since this has come out, they've decided that um, Gleason 1 and Gleason 2 really aren't cancers. So it's a, it's a pattern 3, 4, or 5 um, that are really the cancers that are being diagnosed. So if you look on the left side of the page, this is the, all the choices that you can have in terms of what your Gleason score is gonna, uh, going to be. And this is the th go, ranging from the least aggressive, which is this 3 plus 3 equals 6, to the most aggressive, which is five plus five equals 10. Seems like simple math and seems silly to include three plus four equals seven and four plus three equals seven because uh, we can all do that math. But that actually is meaningful um, to physicians. The number that is listed first is what they see more of. Um, so a four plus three equals seven is actually a more aggressive cancer than a three plus four equals seven. And again, it's because there's more irregular cells, this Gleason four pattern that we're seeing in, uh, on your biopsy than the Gleason three. So it's been decided that this is way too confusing. <laughs> so they've tried to simplify it, but in my mind, they've actually made it a little bit more difficult. So now we've changed it to calling it a grade group and we're calling it one through five. And so the way that works out is if you have a six, a three plus three equals six, that's considered grade one. That's your least aggressive uh, prostate cancer and one that likely is never gonna need any type of treatment. Three plus four equals seven. Well, that's one step more aggressive. That's called your grade two. Four plus three equals seven, still a seven, but we now know that this four means that, um, that there's a more aggressive cancer. That's a grade, uh, grade group three. So it's differentiating those two types of uh, Gleason sevens. And, Honestly, Gleason 7 is the most common finding on, on pathologic studies. And then we get to the more aggressive groups, groups 4 and 5. Group 4 is a Gleason 8, and group 5 is any uh, cancer that has a component of 5 in it. So 4 plus 5 equals 9, 5 plus 4 equals 9, 5 plus 5 equals 10. So that's how we, we differentiate this now. And it's helpful in, in trying to assess whether a patient needs treatment, are, they, are we gonna be able to cure them? Are we only going to be able to palliate them? Are we gonna be able to cure them with one treatment? You know, will surgery alone cure this patient? Will radiation alone 
cure this patient, or is it more likely that we're going to need surgery and radiation uh, and medication to help uh, cure a, 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 a patient of prostate cancer? Um, so that's how we're using the Gleason score. But again, this is strictly going off patterns that are seen by pathologists. Dr. Franzak went through all the genomic tests that are done that actually give us a lot more information about how aggressive a, a cancer really is other than just how it looks under the microscope. So once we get this information, we're able to stratify uh, patients into different risk uh, categories, ranging from a very low risk to a very high risk. And that's going to help us make recommendations in terms of treatment options for patients. And we use not only the Gleason score, but also what the prostate feels like on examination, and also the PSA score. So if your uh, PSA, you know, if you have a Gleason 7, but your PSA is over 20, well, then, you know, you're already in a, into a higher risk group. So this is where uh, prostate cancer risk stratification is utilized to help us uh, determine what treatment options may be best for you. And certainly, when you fall into this green rectangle with, of the intermediate risk, the high risk, and the very high risk, that, that's when we're certainly going to be speaking to you about treatment options. This is when we're going to use our collaboration with the radiation oncologists and medical oncologists at Rocky Mountain Cancer Center to make sure that you have conversations with each and every one of them um, to help you make the best decision for yourself in terms of treatment. So now we can get back into the genomics that we can, uh, that we can use to help decide with these treatment options and not just rely on one or two or you know, a whole group of pathologists looking at these patterns. Um, because we really do need to know what real risk are you facing so that we can help make sure that, number one, if you have a high-risk cancer, that you have your best chance for being cured. That's our goal. But equally as important, if you have a lower-risk cancer, we want to make sure that you're not going to go through any type of treatment that is unnecessary that's going to lead to any lifestyle uh, issues that are commonly associated uh, with prostate cancer treatment um, if you don't need it. So that it is important for us to look with these genomics at your overall survival um, and use these studies to help us determine that so that we can help you understand what the best treatments for you are. Um, but overall survival is not the only thing that we need to know. We need to also know that what's the likelihood that you're never going to have metastatic disease, where disease is not going to spread outside of the prostate, um, because that's going to open up a, a different door of treatment options for you. And we want to make sure that, number one, we can prevent it, but number two, if we can't, that we have treatments for you. And again, uh, when we hear from uh, the radiation oncologists, uh, talk on, on uh, June 28th, they're going to be able to tell us about uh, PMSA uh, imaging and how that has changed uh, the way we're looking at metastatic disease and prostate cancer. But I do think it's important that we have more than just the pathologist's view, and that's using this Decipher genomic test. Uh, Decipher can be done on the prostate tissue. Uh, patients always look at me like, uh-oh, do I have to do that again? Uh, when I talk to them about, you know, testing their prostate tissue, but we are using the tissue that we already have. We don't have to get any more. Uh, we can use it on the, on the biopsy tissue. If you end up having surgery and, and we remove your prostate, there's a, a decipher uh, uh, test that can be done on that tissue as well. Um, but this is, this is a way of looking at the genetics of your prostate cancer and really honing in on what your relative risk is. And, and this test is looking at, at seven different cancer pathways, seven different ways where prostate cancer is going to prove itself to be a bad actor or not a bad actor. And these genes help decide which, which cells are more likely to go that path. And so they can help us decide, do you need treatment? Do you not need treatment? How much treatment do you need? This is, so I've got three, three slides here that are going to show you uh, three different results from uh, sample patients uh, of what the Decipher score result looks like when we get it back. But it's a scoring system where they just decide it's, it's zero to one, um, and it's pretty simple. You know, if you're in the zero to 0.45, that's considered low risk disease. 0.6 and higher is high risk, and in between is the intermediate risk. But we get this, these uh, percentage, percentages over here on the right side 
the first number I would call your attention to is all the way on, on the right, and that's the risk of adverse pathology. And what that means is, all right, well, we've got this Gleason score. What's the likelihood that if we do take out the prostate and get more tissue, what's the likelihood that the pathologist is going to call us and say, hey, you know, I, I know that your prostate biopsy was read as a Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7, but I'm taking a look at it, and this is really a Gleason 8 cancer. It, it's a more aggressive cancer than you thought it was going to be. And that's important to know because that's going to help us decide, do, are you going to need any further treatment? So a patient with low risk, this particular patient whose low risk disease came back with a decipher score of, of 0 0.30, um, their risk of having adverse pathology is 14.6%. Well, that also means that there's an 85% chance that the, that the pathology is going to be exactly what you expected. And then the risk of... Uh, going just towards the left side, the risk of prostate cancer uh, death with treatment for this patient because of their low risk prostate cancer is only 2.4% at the 15 year mark. And their risk of spread of the disease at five and 10 years is only at 0.5% uh, and 1.2%. Now, if, if, we, if this same kind of patient uh, comes in, but their decipher score shows that the, the, the genes do have these other pathways that are more detrimental, and they end up with an intermediate risk score of 0.55, you can see now that as opposed, I'll go back to the, to the other one where the, the risk of adverse pathology is 14.6%. Now by jumping up in the intermediate uh, group, that risk is now, has now doubled. So now we're, we're going, all right, well, this is a patient that we really need to, to treat because, gosh, that we, there's a one in four chance that, that we're gonna end up with uh, worse disease than we, when we, than we think this patient has. And likewise, the other numbers also increase. The, the mortality goes up to 4.6%, and the metastases also go up. Um, again, low numbers. These are patients who are going to be treated, um, but it tells you that, that we need to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of patients with intermediate risk. Now, if they go up to a higher risk, you can see the numbers really jump. So, um, you know, we, we started with a 14% risk of adverse pathology. We went up to 28 now we're at 48%. So this, is, this means one out of every two patients who are gonna have their prostate out uh, so we can get more tissue um, are gonna end up with a, a Gleason score that's gonna show more aggressive disease and more likely to need uh, additional therapy or longer therapy. And likewise, the mortality and the risk of metastases go up. So this is just an example of an important test that we're doing in just about every patient now that we diagnose with prostate cancer. Um, I'll be going into this at our, our next discussion about, uh, it, it, on June 28th, about active surveillance. You know, who are the patients that don't need any treatment? And certainly the decipher score uh, is quite helpful in differentiating those patients and giving them assurance that, you know, if you, if you don't treat it right up front, um, that you have a great chance of doing very well. Um, decipher is not only helpful in patients that are having surgery, it's also um, very important uh, in patients that are going to have radiation therapy. Uh, radiation therapy uh, does quite well. It does better with the, with the utilization of, of uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Those, that's medication that stops a man from making testosterone. Um, and in, there's a duration for how long do you have to be on that medication in order to get excellent radiation therapy. And studies go from anywhere from not at all, all the way to three years. Well, how do we decide if you're someone who can skip the androgen deprivation therapy, someone who needs six months, someone who needs 18 months, someone who needs three years? Well, the Decipher score can help with that. And you'll hear more about that on the 28th. Um, so just to, to, to again, to, to tell you what we're going to be doing on that day, uh, we're going to have our, our two excellent um, radiation oncologist from Rocky Mountain Cancer Center join me, um, and we're going to go through uh, the topics of treatment of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is such a huge subject. It, it's so controversial about whether to get a PSA, when is the appropriate time, do I really need to get one, do I really need a rectal exam in the blood test enough, you know, can I get an MRI, um, that we really wanted to be able to present um, to you in a way that we can show you the different aspects of prostate cancer and let you know how we as, as urologists think about it in terms of evaluating who even needs an evaluation and who doesn't, because we'd really like to walk you through this slowly 
um, and help you understand that, that it's important because prostate cancer is a significant killer, but, but it's also something that if, it's, if you don't have signs that this should be aggressive disease, we'd like to help you avoid going through unnecessary tests. Um, so again, we're gonna continue to work with uh, Boulder Community Hospital, and we're so appreciative of them for giving us an opportunity to speak to you, but also for what they do for all of us, to, for us as urologists to um, be able to diagnose and have access to um, the treatment options. You know, the Da Vinci robot is um, proudly in the Boulder Community Hospital operating room, and it's uh, hard to get on it because so many uh, surgeons are utilizing it. Um, but it's an important component to how we take care of prostate cancer. Um, having radiation oncologists and medical oncologists on site uh, with uh, really state-of-the-art equipment, um, it, it makes it so that patients in Boulder can certainly stay in Boulder and have top-notch uh, care for their prostate cancer. So um, I think with that, we're going to open up to your questions. Oh, my goodness. This is us at the, at the Boulder Boulder. Yep, this is us in... Yep, there's Dr. Siegel right here. There's his wife, Julie. I'm there. There's my dad, who's run every single Boulder Boulder. He's part of that uh, run them all club. This is Dr. Siegel's parents, and this is my sister. So, I mean, we're part of the community here. We want to be part of your, your health care. And so, again, thank you so much for taking your time to join us tonight and listen to this lecture. We're just very grateful. And now we'll be happy to take any questions as long as they're not hard. Okay then, okay, then thank you so much, uh, doctors. That was very informative. And we do have a few questions that have come in, and I imagine uh, a few more will come in. So we will just start with, uh, there's a, a guest who's asked to a, um, it's kind of a two-parter question. Hold on, can you hear me? We can hear Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask this one first. Um, this guest mentions that some men report full erectile function and no issues with urinary incontinence, while others report no more function in either department. His question is, what are some of the reasons for varying degrees of ED and urinary incontinence post-radical prostatectomy? Yeah, so um, the, the, thank you for the question. I mean, the patient is, is uh, completely correct that, that some of the lifestyle complications that we see with robotic prostatectomy, and I'll get into this on the 28th, is uh, urinary incontinence and um, erectile dysfunction. So that, I'll take the erectile dysfunction first. The nerves to the penis run right alongside the prostate. And so um, when we do a large uh, radical procedure and we're, you know, really worried about, you know, really aggressive disease, the MRI shows that the disease may be outside of the prostate, um, we really need to make sure to get all the cancer out. That's the primary goal of the, uh, of the surgery. But if the cancer is only on one side, we can go a little bit closer to the prostate and try to save nerves for you. So I do what's called a nerve sparing uh, radical prostatectomy. Um, it would be nice if the, the, those nerves were, you know, large cables, uh, like, you know, the, the cord that plugs into your, your computer, uh, but that's not what they look like. The, those nerves are a plexus of nerves. They're almost like a spider web. So we don't actually see the specific nerves, and so you don't actually, actually cut it and go, whoops, there it went. Um, instead, we just look at, at the tissue around the prostate. There's usually some fat and some blood vessels, and we know that the, those nerves run through that. And so if there's a side of the cancer, uh, side of the prostate that doesn't have cancer, I can make sure to shave very close to the prostate and leave that behind. Um, other, other times we can't. So it just depends on the biology of the cancer and, and, and uh, again, a, a utilization of the decipher score. Um, there are so many treatment options now available for men with a, a erectile dysfunction that I'm confident that, that you know, if a patient, if, a, if having an erection is important to the patient, then there are ways to obtain an erection after surgery. Uh, likewise, with radiation therapy, the, those same nerves are being radiated, and so those, they can also be affected. So it's pretty common to at least need uh, Viagra Cialis, one of those kind of medications at the beginning. I actually like to start my patients on, um, on those medications early after surgery just to improve the blood flow. 
Um, in terms of the urinary incontinence, there's two real mechanisms for a man to maintain his continence. Uh, one is the prostate, and the second one is the sphincter muscle. The sphincter muscle is just beyond the prostate, so we do have to sort of peel the prostate off of that. So during the operation, that, that, that sphincter muscle is going to get dinged up a little bit. Um, and then we're going to remove the prostate. The urethra, the urinary tube, runs through the middle of the prostate. So I've got to cut that tube on either side in order to get the prostate out and then sew it back together. In order to al allow that area to heal, I leave a catheter across it. Well, that sphincter muscle not only gets a little dinged up during surgery, but now it's had a catheter through it for the eight to 10 days that I leave the catheter in, so it's done no work. And then as soon as the catheter is removed, it realizes, hey, I gotta get back to work, and oh, my, my friend, the prostate's gone, so I've gotta do all of the work. So just about every man's gonna leak initially. And then over time, um, that continence will come back. And also, Dr. Siegel and I were very big on sending our pre-prostate patients, prostate cancer uh, robotic patients, to pelvic floor physical therapy so they can get in tune with that, those pelvic muscles that they're going to need to help with incontinence improvements. So there are sort of exercises yes. and, and Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a small, there's a small percentage of men that will have significant incontinence and may even have to go on to additional procedures to help with that incontinence. But... The, the huge majority are either dry or dry except when they're caught off guard by a sneeze, have a full bladder and, and pick up something heavy. So what I tell men to expect is, you know, hopefully you're going to be completely dry, but you may be at the place where, you know, gosh, you're, you're, you're around your house, you're running to the grocery store, you, you got a pair of jeans on, you may leak a couple drops, but no one's going to know the difference and you're okay but you're gonna go out to dinner with a bunch of friends and you're planning to wear khakis, you may put a small pad in, in, uh, in your underwear uh, you know, during that first year of recovery, but hopefully that's not a long lasting thing. And I, I think that's been the experience with the patients in Boulder. And I will say again, because of the, the emphasis that people in this community put on their good health, they have better muscles, they have better ability to heal, and they are less likely to have this problem um, over the long term. All righty, awesome. So, <clears throat> uh, is an MRI possible if you've had a hip replacement? I'll take that one. So, it is possible. There is some artifact that can be created from the hip replacement, but that certainly would not preclude me from getting an MRI because it may that artifact may not you know, interfere with our ability to see a lesion. So I would not hesitate to do that. Excellent. How important is zinc in prostate health? I, I didn't hear what you said. How important is what? Zinc. 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 You know, there, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of supplements that are out there that um, um, are utilized to try to help uh, prevent prostate cancer. Um, zinc is actually used as something to try to reduce inflammation within the prostate. So I'm not sure it plays a large role in, um, in prostate cancer prevention. Um, if you're looking for ways to try to prevent prostate cancer, there are dietary ways of doing that. Uh, lycopene is a substance that's found in tomatoes and watermelon um, that can help, that studies have shown a reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer. Interestingly, with the tomatoes, it's better to, to, to obtain the lycopene with cooked tomatoes as opposed to raw. Um, selenium has been found to be uh, something that can help um, inhibit the production of prostate cancer. Selenium is found in Brazil nuts, so if you're into Brazil nuts, then you're helping yourself. Uh, soy is another uh, item that has been quite helpful. Um, so the next time you're at a Japanese restaurant, get the edamame. Um, soy sauce doesn't count, but the, the uh, edamame is, is, is a natural plant estrogen and can help uh, prevent prostate cancer. So supplements play a large role. Um, if you're actually interested in that subject, there is a urologist by the name of Dr. Mark Moyad, M-O-Y-A-D, and he's out of the University of Michigan who's written several books about that. Um, there's also a company called Theralogix, uh, T-H-E-R-A-L-O-G-I-X, Theralogix, um, that makes multiple urologic uh, supplements for a variety of things, and one of those things is prostate cancer prevention. So I, I would tell you to go look at those uh, sources for more information. Perfect. 
This guest says you didn't mention doing anything to rule out uh, prostatitis before proceeding with an MRI. How do you rule out infection as the cause? So that's an excellent question. And, you know, that, that has to be a evaluation of the prostate and the PSA, and we have to look and see at the trend of the PSA. So if a man has a prostatitis, usually that PSA will be normal before the prostatitis, but then it will jump significantly with the prostatitis. So that comes back to recheck your PSA, treat the prostatitis, and then recheck the PSA you know, several weeks afterwards. But I think the, there's more of an old school of thought in terms of when a man has an, an elevated PSA to just put them on a course of antibiotics. I don't do that much anymore. Do you do that anymore? That's really not been found to be very beneficial. It, it actually has been found to delay the diagnosis of meaningful prostate cancer. And so nowadays, if, if a man is having pain in the prostate or they just have these symptoms that really are telling me or Dr. Siegel, yeah, this is an infection, then we treat it as such. But certainly, if a man comes with a PSA of 4, 4.5, I'm not going to say, hey, let me give you 21 days of antibiotics and let's see what happens with the PSA. No, I'm going to do more of the genomic testing. I'm going to do more MRI. Those are tests that are, are going, to, going to give results independent of infection. And so I, I don't tend to, to put people on antibiotics with, with prostatitis that, with, no, I, I put them on antibiotics with prostatitis, but not as a, as a standard of care for an elevated PSA. Hopefully that's answering your question. But I think that's exactly the point of us not saying when that patient shows up with a PSA of 4.5, it very well could be prostatitis. And instead of saying, all right, let's sign you up next week, we're going to bring you back for your biopsy, right. that's where we're using all these other tests so that if a man's PSA is elevated because of, of prostatitis, I would expect that when I do a select MDX urine test on you, that it's gonna come back as a very low risk for cancer. And at that point, we're gonna say, all right, it's a, it's a low risk. We're not doing a biopsy now. We're gonna get another PSA, um, and hopefully your prostatitis is resolved, and your PSA is gonna come back down. And, and also MRIs. Often, the MRI radiologist will say, there are signs of prostatitis in this prostate. And, or the prostate is 80 grams and the PSA is seven. And we say, eh, that, that could be why the PSA is seven. You know, there's signs of prostatitis in that prostate on the MRI. So just to, just to reiterate, the testing that we do is, is really much more specific now than, than just saying, here's some antibiotics. Perfect. Is cryotherapy available in Boulder? Cryotherapy? Cryotherapy. Uh, it is not. Um, cryotherapy is something that um, I, I was trained in, uh, I originally got kind of excited to be able to offer something new and different. Um, I got talked out of it. Uh, and the reason was that, that the, for those of you that don't know, cryotherapy is a way of putting probes throughout the prostate, sort of in the same way that you saw that image of the transperineal biopsy, but putting probes throughout the, uh, throughout the prostate and freezing uh, the prostate. The idea is you can freeze the cell and kill the cancer cells. Um, the problem with that is that the urethra, the urinary tube, runs through the middle of the prostate. And that still is an important uh, tube that you need, to, whether you have prostate cancer or not. And so in order to maintain the health of the urethra during cryotherapy, we would put a, a catheter in that was a warming catheter to make sure the urethra stayed warm. Well, the issue with that is about 15% of prostate cancers actually are go right up to the urethra. So that's 15% of patients who aren't gonna get effective treatment. So I've never been a believer of cryotherapy as a initial approach to uh, treatment of prostate cancer. It has been utilized in patients who've had radiation therapy and have evidence of recurrence um, within the prostate and nowhere else. It has some efficacy there, but I, you know, I can tell you that that's where I thought that I would be using cryotherapy uh, in the, the state that I used to practice in. Um, but those patients are few and far between and, and that actually could benefit from that. And I will tell you that the, the, the radiation oncology has only gotten better in terms of being able to cure prostate cancer. So I don't think of that as something that would be 
a, a good tool in our arsenal. I think that you know, we're certainly building up what's available to patients in, in Boulder. Um, and I understand the question and the, the interest in cryotherapy, but I would actually point you in a different direction. And radiation, much safer option. Excellent. Do you know, I had a question about this as well. A guest asks, if the MRI is to find lesions for targeted biopsies, why were other biopsies or towers shown throughout the prostate in the cartoon that you showed? Right, so um, because prostate cancer doesn't always show up on an MRI. And it, it is important to know, again, so if you want a nerve sparing operation, and, and that patient that I showed the picture of, they had three lesions uh, all on the right side of the prostate. I know it looked left, but that was the right side. Um, but they had three lesions on the right side of the prostate. So if I biopsy that area and those come back as significant cancer that requires surgery, and now I've sampled the left side and there's no cancer on that side, I can use that information to say, hey, you know what, it's really safe to do a nerve sparing operation for you on the left side. Um, and maybe not so much on the right side. Um, and you know, there, there have been plenty of instances where there are cancers found in other places in the prostate. So that, that is the standard of care um, that is um, taught by the American Urologic Association is to make sure to, to not just biopsy the lesions, but to make sure to sample throughout the prostate. What, another thing that we'll be talking about on the 28th is whether or not focal therapy uh, makes any sense. You know, if I only have cancer in that one little lesion, can't you just treat that lesion? Um, and that's an interesting question, and, that, and that's being debated and tried now, but it's really important because prostate cancer does tend to happen in little satellite uh, islands around the prostate. It's really important to know that if you're going to go through prostate cancer therapy, that you're treating all of your cancer. And just to reiterate, that's why we do the 12 core biopsy along with the fusion biopsy because often we find cancer that had, it's nowhere near the lesion that we saw on the MRI. And it's, it's important that we don't forget about that. So when we do talk about focal therapy, I, I've seen some really um, bad cases of focal therapy where they have a lot of recurrences on some young guys that chose to do that. And uh, it was not the best choice. Excellent. <clears throat> well, prior Eurolift procedure impact the diagnostic procedures you have discussed this evening, and how will diagnosis, diagnose, by shoot, diagnosis be done post Eurolift? So it will not affect the diagnosis of prostate cancer in the future. In fact, when the Eurolift gets placed, the tab, one of the tabs, gets anchored on the outside of the prostate. And if years later that patient develops prostate cancer and they elect to do radiation, those tabs can be used as markers for identifying the prostate for the purpose of radiation. Urolift is safe with MRI. Urolift does not cause any artifact where we would not see lesions on an MRI and it would not impact even removal of the prostate if you were to elect for a robotic prostatectomy in the future. Is that your understanding as yeah, well? Yeah, and I would also add to it, I mean, there, there are times where patients have um, a lot of voiding symptoms that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and are, and are interested in having radiation therapy, and our radiation oncologist will say, hey, why don't you guys do a Eurolift? Because radiation can cause swelling in the prostate, and that can temporarily affect the uh, ability of a patient to void. So if we can help uh, open that channel up for the patient, that actually may be a benefit. And as Dr. Franzak said, it can be used as a marker to help them identify the exact location of the prostate. And, and we can do Eurolift on patients that have had radiation. I think that's what you also said. Excellent. <clears throat> With active surveillance, how often is having an MRI safe versus another biopsy? Um, well, having another MRI is safe. Um, I, I think the question is in terms of prostate cancer safety. Uh, so I hope I'm getting that, that, that question correct. But, um, you know, the, the standard of care with active surveillance is to repeat a biopsy in usually 6 to 18 months and, you know, generally around the 12-month period. Uh, the way I do that is we'll follow your PSA every three months if the PSA is changing and it's going upwards and I'm really worried that the biology of your cancer has changed, it is more important to, uh, to get the biopsy and get some actual tissue. Uh, on the other hand, if you've had an MRI to stage the cancer 
at the outset, and I know that that, that lesion is where your cancer is, I can use the MRI um, as, as your surveillance tool uh, because I can look at the size changes within that, that lesion. I saw a patient today that we were going over the measurement of their lesion uh, from a year ago and then from uh, this week, uh, MRI, and, and saw that you know, even though the PSA had, had inched up just a little bit, the lesion hadn't really changed. So I'm not, I'm not really as concerned about doing an immediate uh, repeat biopsy. And, and we, we understand that patients are more comfortable getting an MRI than uh, going through multiple biopsies. And we're going to try to limit the number of biopsies you have to go through. Excellent. Does regular ejaculation provide preventative effects? Does lack of ejaculation induce negative effects? I, I don't believe so, no. I, I, don't, I don't know any significant research that has shown that. Yeah, I mean, those questions are, are brought up uh, pretty frequently, but th there's, there's no good data that says more frequent, less frequent is going to uh, make any difference in terms of prostate cancer. Oops. Uh, a guest asked a question, and one of your colleagues is on time, uh, is online an answering this, but I, I will ask it. Uh, is HIFU Medicare approved? HIFU, H-I-F-U, yeah. Medicaid approved. If not, when do you expect it to be? Um, so HIFU is high intensity focused ultrasound. This is one of the, the focal therapies uh, of the prostate. Uh, it, it has now been FDA approved. It took, it took a very long time for it to get FDA approved as a, as a, a treatment for prostate cancer, focal therapy. That's still uh, something that's done in very few uh, locations. Um, it's not available in Boulder. I don't, I don't know anything about insurance coverage. I would guess that Medicare covers uh, HIFU. Um, you know, the, the, all the HIFU work was done at the University of Indiana. So I think if, if someone out there is actually interested in having high food therapy, uh, that's the place I would go to to, to ask questions and receive treatment. Because I, I don't think there's many urologists that are doing that as of yet. Does um, Medicare cover PSA tests for men over 70 years of age? Yes. Should, yes. I mean, th they'll certainly be covered as an annual test. So, so if this is just a screening PSA, you've had normal PSAs your whole life and you're just going for another one, that's referred to as a screening PSA. That can only be done once a year. But if you have a diagnosis like an abnormal PSA, meaning you've had prior PSAs over four, then using that diagnosis code, we can do uh, as many PSAs as we need to. And it is, you know, checking the PSA over 70 is, is the standard of care. Medicare, all the guidelines don't say don't do it. They, sh they say make it a shared decision making with your doctor. So we can assess, you know, does this patient feel that they have 10, 15 years of quality life? Are we, are we looking into something that if we find it, are we going to want to possibly treat it? That's what I want to talk about with my patients. I want to get their sense of that. And it's not like it's not allowed, so they, I would imagine it always will be covered. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Let me make sure I get this uh, back here. Let me ask another one. Oh. This... Uh, uh, a guest asks, is an artificial sphincter an option for incontinence? Yes, an artificial urinary sphincter. Um, and so what that is, is so for, for the patients who've undergone uh, robotic prostatectomy that unfortunately develop significant incontinence, the artificial urinary sphincter is a small cuff. It almost looks like a tiny little blood pressure cuff that goes inside, everything's implanted inside the body. But uh, it's a cuff that goes around the urethra, and in its resting state, it's filled with fluid, and because of that bulk, it obstructs the urethra. And so then when a patient wants to void, uh, they have a little pump down in the scrotum that they can pump. That cycles the fluid out of the cuff and into a little bulb that we, that we can bury in the body somewhere, um, and allows the urethra open so they are able to urinate, and then it cycles itself closed. So, it is an effective uh, treatment for significant incontinence, but it, it, again, we're, we're, you know, we're fortunate that the, it's not 
very common at all that that, they, that is even brought up as a conversation because there's so few patients that have that kind of leakage. Yeah, and, and robotic prostatectomy, the, the way you can see the nerves in 3D, it really has changed the ball game with that. How much does rectal gas compromise the MRA, MRI image prognosis? So that's a good question. I, I wish we had one of our wonderful radiologists from BCH here to answer that, but I, I have talked about that with them, and there's, there's been thoughts of, you know, should there, should there be a repeat MRI if they're noticing too much gas? And they will actually basically tell the patient to come back if it's causing too much artifact. So it, it can definitely compromise it. Um, and too much stool can compromise it. And I know at uh, BCH they don't require any kind of, of rectal probe at all that they did many years ago with those MRIs. But if it's not a good image, they're going to make the patient come back and tell the situation looks better down there and, and redo the image. Does a, bios does a biopsy risk spreading the cancer? That's a, that's a great question. And we, we hear that question a lot because it does seem to make uh, sense that if you put a needle into a tumor and then you pull it back out, that you're going to spread it. But th that has not been uh, found clinically. So um, fortunately for us and for our patients, there, there's no incidence of, of spread that's been uh, found to be secondary to a biopsy. Uh, this uh, guest says, at one time I had read that post-treatments for PCA, about 30% of the patients have had a reoccurrence at the 10-year mark. Can you oh, comment on this? PSA recurrence. Yeah, so, so oh, I mean, okay. yeah, I mean okay. PSA recurrence um, does happen in, in prostate cancer, and, and that's why you know, it's not immediately after surgery, it's not immediately after radiation that we say, hey, you're cured, go away. Um, we need to continue to follow patients. Um, PSA can be detected, and it can be that there are normal cells that are secreting PSA, then there can be cancer cells that either got out before the surgery, um, they weren't taken during the surgery, they were hiding somewhere else. And, and so it's important in those patients to be able to find where the source of the PSA is. So if it's a patient who's had radiation, we're gonna to wanna to do some of these PET scans that you're gonna hear about on the 28th, if I haven't plugged that enough, um, to, to find out, well, is the source of the PSA coming from the prostate itself, and maybe that patient's appropriate for cryotherapy? Or is this PSA coming from a lymph node that wasn't detected in pre-op or um, you know, pre-radiation screening and so now we know exactly where it is. So that is why we will continue to follow our patients. And you know, after a robotic prostatectomy, I'll see patients and get PSAs every three months for a year or two, and then we'll try to space it out and you know, go to six months, go to 12 months. Um, but still, you know, we see, see patients say, hey, yeah, I've got, I had my uh, radical prostatectomy in, in 2007, and we're like, yeah, let's go downstairs and get you a PSA, because we do wanna make sure that um, it stays either very low or undetectable. And in addition to our, our new scans, new PET scans that are out there, also that decipher test that Dr. Siegel talked about is very important. That can help set the pathway for whether there's gonna to need to be more aggressive treatment in the future, more aggressive follow-up, even after ro robotic prostatectomy or radiation. And so that, that, that genomic test is also helping to predict where things might go in the future so we don't, so we have that metastasis-free survival. That's, that's what we want. How does cribiform pattern affect risk evaluation, parenthesis pathology of removed prostate? Okay, so cribiform is, is a, a more aggressive type of pathology. That, that would, if I recall, that would be considered like a, a five on that. Uh, one through five number, I could go back to that. I know what you're talking oh, um, so you know how the cells can be rated it from a number one to a number five, cribiform would be a five. So that would be a very aggressive tumor. Does chronic hydrocele for years portend prostate cancer? No. Uh, the, um, 
a hydrocele is, is fluid around the testicle. Um, so that, that, that would have no impact on the prostate, no increased risk for prostate cancer. Unfortunately, just being a man, having a prostate and getting older is a risk for prostate cancer, so. Okay. Um, uh, is prostate massage an effective preventative therapy? Not that I have ever read in any clinical trial. I have guys that do it, and I don't believe that it would impact prostate cancer. No, I mean, I, I think patients have used them in the past for, um, for sort of chronic treatment for prostatitis, but not in a, not in a way of preventing prostate cancer. Uh, this guest says I'm 82 and have chronic spermatocele. Yep. Is it important for me to know any relationship to prostate cancer? Again, testicles and the prostate don't have any effect on each other in terms of creating prostate cancer, but testicles are important when you're managing aggressive prostate cancer because we want them to make less testosterone. You yes. have the hardest job here having to pronounce all these words. Yeah. Well, you know, and I try my best. Um, uh, this, I may have answered this. Uh, is there a chance of reoccurrence even if the prostate was surgically removed? Yes, uh, unfortunately there is. And, and I mean, if we're gonna go back um, to the Decipher score, um, where was that? Um, you know, so if you have high risk disease, I mean, again, looking at this, this patient who had this risk of 0 0.80, um, there, there's a risk of metastases at, at you know, 6.5% at 10 years. And that's someone who's had either radiation or radical prostatectomy. So unfortunately, you know, prostate cancer is still a cancer. And although a lot of you have heard that, you know, it's a slow growing cancer, you don't need to worry about it, you're gonna die of something else, you're gonna die with cancer, you're not gonna die from prostate cancer. Unfortunately, there still are very aggressive uh, prostate cancers, and that's why it's the number two cancer killer in men. And so there is a chance of recurrence, and that's why it's important that once you have treatment, not just say, all right, I took care of that, but that you continue to follow up, uh, preferably with your urologist, because they're gonna be able to help you guide best with the, uh, what to do with, with you know, a recurrence of PSA, um, and speak to your radiation oncologist if you've had radiation, or if, it's, you know, if that's not available to you, just seeing your primary care physician going, hey, you need to keep following my PSA. Um, because there, there can be recurrences. Yep, follow it every year. Don't, don't ever not have it checked every year. Even if you're 20 years out, make sure you always check that PSA once a year. Does uh, Boulder Medical Center accept only limited insurance plans? Do, what kind of insurance plans? Uh, yes. Only yes. limited insurance plans. So I, I, I think there are some insurances we do not accept, but they're very far and few between. I, I really... I think I would call the Boulder Medical Center and ask, but we accept many, many, many insurance. Great. So I'm, I think you answered this, but there are treatments available if reoccurrence does occur after the prostate has been removed, and you'll probably discuss that on the, at, at part two of this lecture. Right, but, but yeah, and, and honestly, even part two um, doesn't get us as far as we'd like it to because we're, in part two, we're really talking about uh, clinically localized prostate cancer, trying to cure you of prostate cancer. Um, so there, there are advanced cancers. Um, if, you ha if we do surgery on you and we find that your Decipher score is quite high, there, the pathology comes back and says there's actually tumor still left uh, inside because the, the tumor had broken outside of the prostate. In those situations, we often use radiation therapy after surgery to try to um, kill the remaining cells and still provide you with a, a cure of prostate cancer. But there are also such bad actors that despite surgery, despite radiation, um, that the prostate cancer recurs. Or it may be that you, when you show up, unfortunately, you had such a bad prostate cancer, you didn't catch it early enough, it's already in lymph nodes, it's already in bone, and then there's lots of other treatments, and that's when we really utilize our relationship with the medical oncologist because there have been, just like in a lot of other cancers, prostate cancers made great strides in providing newer and uh, 
better tolerated medication to treat the most aggressive, the most widely spread um, cancers. So we, we, we do have a lot of things that we can treat you with after surgery, after radiation, and if unfortunately there's still prostate cancer present. This uh, guest asks, he says his PSA has been stable at 5.5 to 6 for seven years after negative prostate biopsy. Please comment on this stable range of PSA for that many years. So that's, first of all, reassuring that it's stable. And the, you know, the negative biopsy is also reassuring. The, you know, the question is, what's the size of his, of his prostate? I mean, if he's got a really large prostate or a, you know, just enlarged prostate, then that PSA may, may speak because of that large prostate. And if it's stable, I just call that very reassuring. I mean, he needs a rectal exam every year, PSA, um, but I, I would find that reassuring. We also look at what's called the PSA velocity and what is it the PSA change every year. So even if you have an elevated PSA, if it's gonna stay stable or just inch up a little bit, that may be just an indicator of benign disease. When your PSA grows by more than 0.75 in a year, that's the tipping point where you say, hey, that, that velocity is a little bit too fast. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to get uh, more of an examination. So if it stays in the six to seven range, you're doing great and keep doing what you're doing. If the next time you get it checked, it goes up to 9.4, it's at that point that not only, you know, the rectal exam would, would be obviously important, but then that's when an MRI and or a lot of these genomic tests that we've been talking about would be helpful to identify whether that's a problem or not. Excellent. We have time for two more questions. This guest asks, if I'm taking the time to empty my bladder, does it really matter how slow the flow is? Yeah, it, it you know, part of it is a subjective, what bothers the patient, but part of it is, is that bladder going to get really, really slow and eventually not be able to work? So you want to not just settle for a bladder that is slow to empty and you sort of just deal with it. Because you never know, next week it may be a trip to the ER and a catheter placed and your bladder isn't going to work really well no matter what intervention gets done. So I think it's important to evaluate you know, your symptoms that you have and make sure your bladder health is, is something that should not, your bladder health should be evaluated, that's what I want to say. And uh, last question of the evening, it's my favorite. Is Dr. Siegel related to George Clooney? <laughs> um, yes, he's my identical twin brother. Okay, yeah, well, <laughs> we all thought so. Okay, great. So uh, we have come to the end of our time tonight. We sincerely thank our experts tonight for their time and expertise and um, do uh, make sure that you look for the um, continuation of this prostate cancer discussion. It's on the 28th of this month. And um, so uh, again, we say thank you and we'll let you know that a recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. So you can rewatch this and check out the slides again if you uh, want to review it again, feel free. And you'll also receive a post-lecture survey by email. So please take a minute to fill this out when you receive it. And um, thank you again for joining us tonight and have a nice evening.